Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper. The title of today's episode is The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's now or never our mitigation moment. I'm very fortunate to have our guest with us, Stephen Running, Regent Professor Emeritus of University of Montana, but also one of the authors that was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for the important work in the 2007 report. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, it's uh, good to be with you, at least by Zoom. It would be more fun to be there in person. I know, I hear there's too much snow still in Montana. It unfortunately is snowing out my window right now. Spring sometimes starts slowly here. Well, you know, that's what we're looking at here is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and its most recent third report from the working group, it kind of completes the trilogy of the sixth assessment. But what actually is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and how did they operate and what do they do? Yeah, um, the IPCC was, I think, founded around 1990 I, and um, by the United Nations. This is just as the world was starting to become aware of climate change as, as, uh, as a, a, a earth system dynamic. And uh, so there really wasn't, wasn't much of anything known and there wasn't really a forum for, for um, uh, exploring the new research that was coming out. So it was laid out with three working groups. Uh, working group one covers the, the climate factors themselves, you know, the changes, uh, the temperature and the rainfall patterns and uh, really the direct physical climate. Working group two covers the impacts of the changing climate. And uh, so that would include things like sea level rise, uh, ocean acidification, uh, glacial retreat, like we think about in Montana, the impacts of the climate drivers. And then the third working group is um, the adaptation and mitigation options for humanity. And so it, uh, in the beginning, was very, very small. The first few uh, IPCC reports had, had very little in working group three. Now, every country is uh, allowed to send scientists to as authors for this report. And so uh, as an approximation, each working group was about 200 authors from around the world. And so totaling uh, something close to 600 authors worldwide for each one. Um, there was, um, I think the first, well, IPCC reports started really getting noticed with the third assessment in 2001. And that's when it started making world headlines. And so uh, I was then in the fourth assessment in 2007, there was a fifth assessment in 2013, and now we're having the sixth assessment. Now uh, the working group one of the physical climate came out last August. The working group two came out a couple of months ago. I don't remember exactly. And then the working group three is what just came out in the last week. And so uh, this, as, as times have moved on, um, in the beginning, the working group one was really the core the core report, because that was just looking at the climate. How is the climate changing? Where is it changing? How fast? Um, now the working group three is becoming the most pivotal of the chapters because the working group one is uh, trends are well established. We know how much CO2 is rising. We know how fast temperatures are changing, uh, things like that. We know the impacts. We have long records now of things like sea level rise and glacial retreat and uh, ongoing drought and wildfire patterns. 
and flooding and all those things we know pretty well. And now what's really starting to become the pivotal uh, report is working group three. And that's what came out this week. Because what it does is look at what options does humanity have to deal with this changing climate that's now well measured and um, and make and, and uh, basically lay out the set of options. Now it's important to realize that IPCC very strictly does not choose options. And we, this was drilled into us very carefully. We don't choose the best and the worst options. We just lay out the smorgasbord of here are the different things that humanity can do. And it's up to policymakers and the public to choose which, which things will actually do. That's a great coverage. And it reminds me of being there in Geneva at the World Neurological Organization. But as you pointed out, it really, that's what matters is bringing this knowledge home. And the Working Group 3 report provides an updated global assessment of climate change mitigation, progress and pledges, as you described, examines the sources of the global emissions, but it also explains developments in emission reduction and mitigation efforts, as well as assessing the impact of national climate pledges that you were talking about in the policy aspect in relation to long-term emission goals. So it's true, it shares about the options, but also the opportunities. And I think a big point it looks at though is, it's also a dire warning for our world. It's letting us know where we're headed if we continue on the path we're on today. Oh, absolutely. I think back to the report I did and uh, was part of in 2007. And at the time, the climate trends were well established, but it wasn't so clear what the impacts were going to be, how fast these impacts were going to uh, develop. And certainly the different mitigation options were still very, uh, very much in their infancy. Well, now 15 years later, uh, those things are becoming very much more clear uh, first, what, what the impacts are. Uh, we have global monitoring systems of all types all around the world. Um, I like to explain to, to my public audiences that the climate system is composed of the atmosphere, obviously, but then the ocean, the land, and the cryosphere, snow and ice. And so those are the four components, and we measure all those components all around the world. There's, um, you know, there's buoys out in the oceans measuring uh, sea level rise and ocean temperature and ocean acidification. There's uh, measurements on land measuring uh, snowpack and glacial retreat and things like that. And obviously the atmosphere is very well measured the CO2 concentration, the emissions of CO2 and methane and, and um, other greenhouse gases. And so now we have all these measurements that have pretty well come on in the last 20 years. I, I couldn't list these 20 years ago um, and now we can. And now we, we have a couple decades of measurements to see the trends developing. And so now this is where it's very much time, as this working group three report says, is that uh, in a way it's time to quit talking and start doing. And what should we do? And what should be the highest priority? And, um, That's a great point. It's we have the measurements. Now we have to really build the movement. But the good news is throughout the report, there's points that talk about that we can really stave off these worst impacts of climate change, that they're within our grasp with the technologies that exist today. And it also seems that in some ways, if we do move from oil, coal, and gas and fossil fuels, the renewable energies are actually dropping very rapidly. And there's reason for hope for the nations of the world. We just have to be bold enough to take advantage of some of those options and opportunities. Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. When I compare, the situation with our report in 2007 and to, to the options, the technological development we have now, 
uh, solar power and wind power is now the cheapest, the cheapest new electric power production almost everywhere in the world is, is no longer coal. Uh, coal always was the cheapest for decades and it isn't anymore. And in fact, it's now absolutely clear that the highest priority for humanity is to quit burning coal. Uh, the US is well on its way to doing that, but that is not the case for the rest of the world. And so that is, is really priority number one is to quit burning coal and moving to these other types of electric power production. If we, yes, no, if we look at that, there are 17 chapters of the Working Group 3 report, and it assesses the mitigation of climate change, examines the sources of global emission, and explains developments in emission reduction or mitigation efforts. What do you think are some of the most important steps that developed and developing countries could take? Well, it's um, a two to, uh, to re reiterate, the absolutely first thing is to quit burning coal. Um, the, the next, and when you quit burning coal, you want to substitute with the renewable uh, power. I haven't been to Hawaii now for about 15 years, and what I hear is there's solar powers and wind turbines just all over the place now. Uh, Hawaii is a perfect example where I think where you had to import all your uh, diesel fuel forever. And so to me, Hawaii was a perfect example of a place that would benefit most immediately from getting off of fossil fuels. Right. Uh, it's good policy. It's better for our health. And it also, instead of being just a tourism mecca, it actually allows us to be a space where people could come to see a workshop of how to make it work. But as you pointed out, it has to be today, not tomorrow. And I believe we'll shut our last coal plant in September of this year. Oh, good, good. So it's scheduled and then that's, that uh, couldn't be better. Uh, you know, the next things, one of them now is, is, is probably long established was LED lighting. Uh, LED lighting, it was, we're now, it's routine, but when that came on, uh, an LED bulb used 10% of the electricity of old light bulbs. So changing all the light bulbs in the whole country and the whole world to LED was actually huge. And we're now pretty well past that way. I think, uh, uh, well, at least, at least in, the, in the developed world. And so that's, that's been another success that we're already uh, uh, completely past. Now the new one, it's just turning the corner is electric vehicles. And uh, I think we're, we're now seeing finally the inflection point where every car manufacturer in the world is talking about and scheduling and transitioning to electric vehicles. And I couldn't say that even three years ago. And so this is absolutely where we're we're right at the point of transition starting. And it's gonna be interesting to see how that rolls out, but it's, it's definitely the next big step. It's true, at the Super Bowl this year, there were more EV electric vehicle ads by far and much more creative than the traditional vehicles. And that really gets to a point that in the report, the 1.5 degree pathway requires CO2 emissions to reduce by 48% by 2030, and to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. So do you believe that this cleaner, safer, more sustainable future is achievable? And if we do this, we can do that by the, really that major shift away from fossil fuels, starting with diverting subsidies and moving towards these renewable energy storage, as well as the vehicles that you shared earlier? Yeah, it, um, we really have all the technology now to make this transition, even if we didn't invent anything new, which we know we will, you don't know until it arrives that there will be new inventions, but we, we don't really need to wait for that anymore. I think this electrification of, of transportation is now well underway. And, um, and so the, this, this is one of the cornerstones that uh, 
we didn't have uh, have uh, any momentum on at all, even five years ago. I I do want to talk about the 1.5 degree uh, threshold that, uh, of course, that we're now approaching. I think most climate scientists say that we're almost certainly going to exceed it, um, which uh, is is unfortunate. But I think the important thing for for the public to understand is there isn't actually any magic threshold at 1.5 where at 1.4 you're okay and at 1.6 the world's going to end. It's really a continuum where uh, the, uh, the, the, the warming is just going to be progressing. And so I'm a little concerned now that some commentators are overreacting to this issue that we probably are going to break through 1.5. And there I'm hearing some pretty hysterical, uh, some pretty hysterical um, comments about that. And I wish, I wish we would be able to stop uh, the warming trend before then, but it doesn't appear like we will, but that shouldn't that really shouldn't inhibit us from getting to work on what's already now possible. Yeah, I agree. I mean, when you look though, for the people of the Pacific, the 1.5 to stay alive was crucial because it, it meant for Tuvalu, that so low lying atoll, that it could forever change their world. And uh, the Climate Vulnerability Forum founding chair, uh, he was former president of the Maldives, Mohammed Nasheed, he did say, and point, as you said, the IPC has confirmed that the world is now perilously close to breaching the Paris Agreement target of limiting warming to 1.5. But it's that point that we have to take action every day and yeah. build momentum and not give up them, but more importantly, everything we do now. So unfortunately, it's always told by your fellow Nobel laureate, uh, Vice President Al Gore, that political will is a renewable energy, but we're not doing enough in our public policy realm to make that shift. So what are some of the things that we could push our elected officials, but also corporations to make sure that we do strive for the 1.5? It's at least in a way like the sustainable development goals. It's to give us that goal to then work towards, but then not paralyze us in our policy making in our everyday practices. Yeah, I've, I've it, it is disappointing that probably the slowest acting component of our society has been our political leadership. And uh, I say that for the United States and, and really for most of the rest of the world. Uh, even, even the Paris Climate Agreements and the, and the national um, uh, emission reduction goals, they, almost no country is going to meet the goals that they that they voluntarily established uh, back uh, seven years ago. And, and so in a way, the private sector has done more by far than the political sector. I mean, the development of, of wind and solar has been just stunning how far they brought the prices down. It's absolutely remarkable. We never imagined solar energy could get as cheap as it now is uh, back in 2007. And so uh, we really have some, uh, ha have had some tremendous success. Now, what big corporations always have to, have to anticipate is what the public, uh, uh, the public interest and the public demands are going to be before they transition into anything new that's a costly changeover like energy uh, systems. And so uh, they've been slow to make some of the changes. And, and yet what I'm finding is we wanna keep pushing the politicians, but we can't rely on them because they just have already shown that they're not gonna come along fast enough. So I think wider social pressure and just social interest uh, is, is the most important thing we can be doing now. We won't stop with um, pushing our political leaders for action, but I, I think we won't 
sit around waiting for them to act because we've watched the federal government uh, not pass critical bills over and over in the last few years. And yet we can all be doing things uh, not only at the state level, but certainly at the personal level that uh, make a difference right now. And um, true. in the report, it did talk about personal actions shifting from driving our regular vehicles to walking to bicycling yeah. to focusing on electric public transportation. Yeah. But it's also building a movement then of many people doing this, not only in our countries, but around the entire world. And the, that's the good aspect is this report really does concentrate and calls on humanity to create a mitigation movement because we can't just adapt our way out of it because the adaptation to the countries that aren't producing all the fossil fuels and the carbon will not be enough. We have to look at reducing and refreshing the way we think about what matters most. Right, and, and we, one of my favorites, I have to admit that has, has had a dramatic uh, development in the last 10 years are electric bicycles. I was a bike commuter my whole career. It's about three miles down to my university, down a country road with very little traffic. So I've always been a bike rider, but these new electric bikes are absolutely remarkable. And they, they really allow almost anybody to be able to, to uh, use a bike for commuting in the kind of one, one to five mile distance really effortlessly. And, and, and they've developed very nicely. Nowadays, I think in Europe, half the new bikes sold are electric bikes. I know in China, it's the same thing that just, uh, it's really taken over the bicycle market. And it's just an example of where um, a, a new development in an existing technology of bikes is making them very much more uh, comfortable and uh, reliable for changing our transportation and, and trying to get people out of their cars whenever we can. No, that's true. And you can see that in Geneva, there's so many electric bicycles. Yeah. Everyone's getting around on them and way before we saw them here. So that's the other side is in the world today, we're more interconnected so we can look at all of those different options. And in a way, as you said, it's really a smorgasbord for sustainability. And the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the 2030 Agenda plus the Paris Agreement provide in a way that menu for the mitigation movement of how we can take actions going forward to aim for that 1.5 Celsius because we do want to avoid as much as possible those multiple climate hazards that will impact the most vulnerable soon making oh, sure yeah. that there's less floods, less drought, less heat stress, yeah. more pressure on our agriculture, water, fisheries, health, biodiversity, and the cascading crises. What would you say would be a couple steps that we should push our politicians to do immediately and other actions we can take as, as individuals going forward to take those options provided by the working group number three in IPCC with assessment six and see where we can go forward. So we could tell our children, the actions we took and the way we averted a uh, worst crisis. Yeah, one of my favorites and one that's relevant to every single one of us is our food production and food consumption. And uh, many studies have shown that worldwide, we waste close to a third of the food grown ends up being thrown out for various reasons. It, um, and this is something where every single one of us has a stake in how we buy food, uh, how well we use it, or do we let it sit in the refrigerator until it's rotten and throw it away? Uh, when we go to the supermarket, uh, do we choose uh, local foods uh, that don't have a big carbon footprint to uh, fly in? Uh, of course, I have to watch. I love when I can get a Hawaiian pineapple here. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't have a pineapple if I, if I only ate local food. So you can take this too far, but I, I think the, the bigger point is food production in storage and consumption is one where every single one of us will gain from just doing a better job. 
of uh, uh, growing and, and harvesting and processing the food more efficiently and then using the food more efficiently. So this incredible waste of food is, is reduced and hopefully eliminated. That, that has a big overall carbon footprint. It's um, remarkable and it's one every one of us can work on. It's a great point. If we just take a moment and we build this movement, we know millions of lives will be affected if we don't act, but we can look at what is possible. So what's important is, as you said, sometimes these reports are so scientific, but we need to be able to share the substance and the steps going forward that we can take together to make sure that this report doesn't just sit on a shelf gathering dust, but more importantly, allows us to look at this window to see what we can do to save our world going forward. Yeah. I think another thing that we can all work on is uh, the throwaway society and the single use society where uh, so many things we use once and toss and, uh, and every step uh, as we go through our day, we should be looking at how can we reuse uh, uh, things, uh, yeah, you know, containers um, and uh, uh, clothing is another one people never think of. Um, that uh, a lot of clothing people buy, wear a few times, then it sits in their closet for years and, and then they dump it. And uh, so it's another example where if we were just more conscientious about our carbon footprint of these everyday things, uh, it adds up to making a big difference. I appreciate you bringing up the issue of fast fashion. It's something that's not considered at all. And it's one of those aspects of SDG number 12, responsible consumption and production. Yep. And yep. it's really coming up with this mitigation menu allows us to look at all of the global goals and then implement them on the ground in our daily lives. So I wanna thank you so much, Steve, for coming on and sharing with us what is possible and how we can take this scientific language and this smorgasbord of sustainability practice to make our world better and show that the time is running out, but it's not unavoidable. We can understand the science and we can take actions that then bring us closer to the 1.5. Yeah, yep. I think these, these are things that every one of us in our daily lives can make a difference in and actually be quite comfortable doing. That's a great point too. It's, one is, oh no, how can we do it? We already have the technology. And two, it's not looking at the sacrifice. It's actually pointing out how everything is connected. We actually will be healthier the more we walk and then we use less fossil fuel. So it's making those connections and then taking care of all the things that people consider or worry about post COVID or on a daily basis, depending on when beach season's coming up and your snow stopping in uh, Montana. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Stephen, for making time. We'll have to, it could be Stephen biking as well as running. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. And we appreciate all of your work over the decades to be a scientist, to be able to make sure that we know what we need to do. And we'll do our best to make sure our politicians take the right actions as well. Good, good. This has been fun. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.